Alrighty, hello everybody. This is Professor Iris Miano giving you your week five, day nine lecture video on chapter four, the very beginning of chapter four. So we're going to cover two sections and they are pretty disjoint from one another, you're going to find. Um, we're going to start things off with the parallel postulate, which will right off the bat um, include a mention of constriction six, which I will demonstrate in a different video because that's in your 4.1 um, section of the textbook. Uh, that's the very first thing that gets covered. So um, I thought I would mention it here. And it's a construction of a perpendicular line oddly enough, even though uh, we talk about uh, parallel lines and lots of uh, different types of angles that come about from parallel lines being cut by another line. Well, I will tell you all about that plus more as soon as we get started um, uh, outlining some very important terminology. Um, but first, I wanted to say a few interesting uh, slash important things about being parallel. Now, I'm not just saying parallel lines uh, because I'm talking about a little bit more of an expanded um, idea behind uh, things being parallel. More than just lines could be parallel. And by that I mean planes can be parallel. Um, but it, that's neither here nor there. As far as lines are concerned, um, parallel lines are lines that are in the same plane but do not intersect. Uh, by definition, that's um, uh, how they are categorized. Um, and yes, like I was just getting to, but rambling on and on, um, a moment ago, the concept of being parallel ex also extends to planes. So those are, you know, two-dimensional uh, surfaces that exist in three-dimensional space. And as long as they don't cross each other, they are considered to be parallel. And then when they do cross each other, if you remember from a postulate that was presented, oh, so many se uh, sections ago, uh, they do so forming a line, but that's just a little bit of review. And furthermore, a line can be parallel to a plane. So as long as the line never um, intersects, with, like never pokes uh, the plane, then they are said to be parallel to one another. Okay, let's go ahead and identify, categorize, define several important terms as they pertain to uh, parallel lines being cut by an additional line called the transversal. So the very first thing that I want to define is this line that cuts through um, uh, not, not necessarily parallel lines. As you can see here, uh, lines M and N are not quite parallel. They look like they would be pretty close, but if you were to extend them uh, furthermore beyond these arrow points down here, they would eventually cross. So anyway, um, this term transversal is designated for any line that crosses two or more other lines. So in this case, as you can see, this line L is lit up in red. That's because it's acting as the transversal on lines M and N. And just to be clear, M and N are not necessarily parallel. I guess they could be if there was some sort of a designated um, uh, kind of a symbology or statement off to the side that said they were parallel, then we would be able to assume that they are. And then myriad other things would be able to be assumed about uh, pairs of angles or collections of angles. Okay, so anyway, maybe going back one, just a tick. So again, just to reiterate, line L is acting as a transversal. It's a line that crosses two or more other lines um, for, in this case, lines M and N are the ones that are being crossed by the transversal line L. All right, so in, um, in this case, this very general case where we have the transversal L crossing two other lines, M and N, eight angles are formed in the, um, uh, via the inter uh, intersection points that are occurring, okay? So with these eight angles, several um, types of angles are formed and collections of angles are formed. And there's relationships uh, among these uh, collections of angles that are going to be defined via postulate and theorem a little bit later in this section. So let's just define what it means to be an interior angle, exterior angle, corresponding alternate interior, alternate exterior. You could probably guess what a few of them 
um, are in regard to this figure, but we're going to define them uh, very much clearly uh, with this context so that there's no possible way that we would confuse uh, uh, which angles are being uh, categorized as what. Now, furthermore, I like to rely on this analogy to kind of describe the relative location of these um, angles in regard to being able to define them. So. I like to say that lines M and N in this um, particular case are kind of like acting like sandwich bread. Okay, they're making a sandwich. And the transversal L is kind of like the toothpick that's going through that sandwich. So if we think about it that way, then the interior angles are all of the angles that are inside of that sandwich. That's, again, uh, if you're, uh, hopefully this, um, uh, analogy will be helpful in regard to determining which uh, angles are being uh, identified. So the interior angles, therefore, with this figure would be angles 3, 4, 5, and 6 because they're inside of the two lines that are being cut by the transversal. Okay, And you could probably guess, based on that example and definition, uh, which angles would be considered the exterior angles? These are the ones outside of the sandwich. That would be angles 1, 2, 7, and 8. Okay, moving on. Corresponding angles. These are pairwise um, collections of angles, and we're going to find a little bit later on that they have a special relationship between one another, but they are just defined as angles that are in the same general area uh, when two lines are cut by a transversal. So for uh, the first pair of corresponding angles that I have highlighted in red, angles one and five, notice that in their collection of um, you know uh, adjacent angles that are formed when the two of the lines are intersecting, uh, angles one and angle five are in the upper left-hand side of the collection of four angles. You feel me on that? So angle one is uh, in the upper left, angle five is in the upper left. So, furthermore, um, there are angles, uh, there are other pairs of corresponding angles. Angles one and five are just one such pair. There's also angles two and six are corresponding to each other. Angles three and seven are corresponding to each other. And finally, angles four and eight also have that relationship that they correspond to one another. Okay, um, alternate interior angles. Those are going to be inside the sandwich, that's what the interior is saying, and alternate is indicating that they're on opposite sides of the toothpick, if you follow my toothpick sandwich analogy. So angles four and six meet that criteria, and then distinctly, but uh, you know similarly, angles three and five are also another pair of alternate interior angles. So if you get that, um, definition and example, you will be able to probably through context clues determine which angles are alternate exterior angles. That'll be angles two and eight. So uh, exterior meaning outside the sandwich, alternate still meaning um, on opposite sides of the toothpick. So that's angles two and eight, angles one and seven. Okay, now if lines M and N, the lines being cut by the transversal are parallel, then certain things can be stated definitively, either by a postulate or by theorem, uh, about the relationships between some of these angles. So we're going to go ahead and introduce um, uh, some of these uh, some of these characteristics uh, by going through all of the theorems, postulates in this section. Starting with the first theorem, so notice the numbering, this is the first theorem of section 4.1 and it says from a point not on a given line there is exactly one perpendicular to the given line okay so give yourself a line and some point on, not on the line so for instance we have line BC with non-included point A try to and you know after you watch the construction video um, for uh, construction 6 that I will post directly after this one um, on the Canvas uh, materials for the day. Uh, you will be able to actually construct the line that I'm going to just go ahead and show you right here. Let's say that we had, oh, look at this. That's a little bit of a uh, <laughs> an accident there. This, is this D is supposed to be right here in this corner indicating the point of intersection. So just go ahead and in your mind, move it over there. <laughs> oh man. 
I don't feel like restarting this video. So uh, line AD then is intersecting with the given line BC. It goes through a specified point A and it is uh, perpendicular. And so the point of this theorem is to say that this perpendicular line going through this specified point is unique. It's the only such line that could uh, possibly occur um, in regard to these uh, given items, the point and the line. And please do uh, note this uh, correct notation in the use of this um, symbol indicating mathematical shorthand for the phrase is perpendicular to. So that means that this statement reads line AD is perpendicular to line BC. Okay, postulate 10. Through a point not get on a given line, exactly one line is parallel to the given line. Okay, so now same given items, uh, some line BC and a non-included point A, draw to the best of your ability, just kind of um, uh, wing it, uh, estimate what the line would look like that's parallel to BC, but going through point A. It would look something like this, right? And you can call it AD. And this gives us a chance to introduce notation associated with um, the mathematical shorthand symbol for is parallel to. That's these two kind of longish vertical lines. So this phrase right here reads as line AD is parallel to line BC. And the point of this postulate, just like the previous first theorem, is to state that no other line could go through a specified point and some given line besides this one that we drew here if indeed the lines need to be parallel. Okay, great. Now postulate 11. If two lines are cut by a transversal, then pairs of corresponding angles are congruent. So recall what corresponding angles are. If you recall, uh, the definition was something of the, of the sort like um, angles in two separate clusters of four that are in the same general area. So here is a figure we can rely on here, and I believe you have um, the same one in your lecture notes, where we have lines M and N, and I have a statement off to the side uh, definitively categorizing them as parallel. So when parallel lines are cut by transversal, in this case, line L, then uh, anytime you have two lines cut by a transversal, you're gonna have eight total angles formed here. They are numbered one through eight. So the corresponding angles are congruent to each other. Cool. Okay, so which ones are the corresponding angles again? Angles one and five, right? To be, If you're gonna start with uh, <laughs> one, its corresponding angle is five, and they're congruent to each other. So this is what we get to conclude by virtue of this postulate. And remember, in general, postulates do not ever need to be proven. They're just um, accepted as proven fact right off the bat. They're often worded very similarly to theorems, but they're um, such a common fundamental knowledge that we just accept them as truth right away without having to prove them. Okay, so angles one and five, angles two and six, angles three and seven, and angles four and eight are distinct pairs of corresponding and therefore congruent angles. So here is the entire list of um, congruent angle pairs by virtue of being uh, corresponding angles when two parallel lines are cut by a transversal. This first part, the antecedent or hypothesis as it's now called of this postulate is vital to being able to make this conclusion. If you go back to the original uh, figure when we were just defining some of these terms like transversal and corresponding angles and such, those two lines in that case M and N were not parallel to each other so you would not be able to make this uh, conclusion happen if the lines you're traversing are not parallel in the first place just to be clear okay you have to have parallel lines, parallel lines first cut by a transversal and then you can make this conclusion about corresponding pairs of angles okay Moving on, the next uh, several theorems are worded very similarly and uh, can be illustrated using the same figure. So just go ahead and reuse that figure, uh, but do list um, the pairs of congruent or otherwise uh, uh, related angles underneath the theorem in your lecture notes if you're following along that way. Here's theorems, uh, the second theorem in section 4.1. If two parallel lines are cut by a transversal, so we have that same preamble, then the pairs of alternate interior angles are congruent. Now, which angles are alternate interior angles? That'll be angles four and six and three and five. And here's the exhaustive list of pairs of correspond, or uh, excuse me, pairs of congruent angles by virtue of being alternate interior angles when two parallel lines are cut by a transversal. 
Okay, so I would definitely write those down. All right, the third theorem in this section, if two parallel lines are cut by a transversal, la 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 la, you're gonna say that so many times over and over again, then the pairs of alternate exterior angles are congruent. So which ones are alternate exterior angles? Those will be angles two and eight, and one and seven. Here's the exhaustive list for you if you are following along with your lecture notes. Go ahead and write those down. All right. The fourth theorem in this section, if two parallel lines are cut by a transversal, then the pairs of interior angles on the same side of the transversal are supplementary. So which angles would those be? We haven't really like talked about the connection between those particular angles. So we've gotta be same side of the transversal, so same side of the toothpick, but interior. Now that'll be angles three and six, right? They are supplementary to each other according to this theorem, and angles four and five. So remember, the same side of the transversal means same side of the toothpick if you're thinking sandwich. Interior means inside the sandwich. So that's why these uh, collections of angles are uh, connected this way, As in, by virtue of this theorem, we get to conclude that they're supplementary to each other. So definitely write this down if you're following along with the lecture notes. All right. Similar wording, painfully similar. Let me read it out loud to you. This is the fifth theorem in the section. If two parallel lines are cut by a transversal, then the pairs of exterior angles on the same side of the transversal are supplementary. So we're going outside the sandwich, but same side of the toothpick. That's angles one and eight, and two and seven. So go ahead and make sure you note that they are um, two such supplementary pairs by virtue of this theorem. Okay, moving on. Oh, here's our um, uh, example, partially completed proof uh, for this lecture. And here we go. Notice that we have a figure, a given, a proof statement, and a proof that's almost complete. It's like halfway there. We have uh, most of the statements, a couple are missing, and then uh, several missing uh, reasons or justifications. Okay, so we're going to go through them one by one. Notice that we're given a figure of three um, lines L, M, and N, and then transversal T. Note also that one, two, three, four angles are named by virtue of a number inside their interior. So we are given that parallel lines L and M are in play, and then M is also parallel to N. So you may be thinking, oh, well, does the transitive property work for parallel lines? Can I just say that L is parallel to N? Well, we haven't come to that conclusion just yet. Um, spoiler alert, it turns out that it is true, but we haven't yet proved it. So that's not something that we're gonna go into uh, just yet. Here is how um, the textbook author uh, proves uh, this, this writes up this proof, um, given the amount of, uh, you know, um, definitions, theorems, postulates, uh, that we have currently at our disposal. So first, notice that the first statement is L is parallel to M. It looks like it's the first half of the given information. So let's go ahead and put given in this position right there. And then from there, it looks like angles one and two are matched up as a pair of congruent angles. Notice that they are in corresponding positions. Indeed, they are. And what do you know about parallel lines? that are cut by a transversal and the angles that are um, in corresponding positions. What's true about them? They're congruent to each other. So I went ahead and uh, made a very truncated uh, version of that postulate. I believe it's postulate 11. Uh, parallel lines cut by a transversal, I just shortened up transversal, uh, makes corresponding, I also shortened up corresponding. I use the symbol for angles and congruent. I think that's fine. Like if you ever see me uh, shortening up or, uh, you know, abbreviating some words or using symbols in order to make a theorem, like, uh, more concisely put, then you are welcome to do it in exactly the same way, for sure. Um, so yeah, we're using this postulate 11 business, noticing that for parallel lines L and M, angles 1 and 2 happen to be corresponding, so therefore they must be congruent. Um, so... Then, uh, notice in statement three, we have angles two and three as being congruent to each other. Hmm, they seem to be in what positions relative to one another? 
well, they are vertical angles, and we had a theorem recently presented in a previous section uh, stating that vertical angles are congruent. One thing I do not want you guys to do when you see vertical angles is to claim their congruency by virtue of the definition. Oh no, honey. Vertical angles definition says nothing about them being congruent to one another. The definition of vertical angles, just as a little bit of a refresher, if anybody is like, huh, what are you saying? Uh, vertical angles are angles in opposite positions when two lines intersect. At what point, tell me, please, at what point in that definition are the angles being categorized as being congruent to each other? Never, none. It's not part of the definition. It is, however, part of the uh, theorem that's presented shortly after the definition, which states vertical angles are congruent, and it's been proven, we've moved on from that section, so we could just use that as, as factual justification for stating that any angles that are, uh, that can be defined as uh, vertical, like angles two and three are, by virtue of this figure, you get to state that they are congruent to each other by literally saying this, this theorem, vertical angles are congruent, okay. Notice that statement for and justification or reasoning for is already uh, given to you, given, given. Um, and so we'll move on to statement five, which says that angles three and four are congruent to each other. Hmm. Well, angles, or sorry, uh, lines M and N as the second half of the given information were said to be parallel, and angles three and four happen to be in what positions relative to one another? Well, they're corresponding angles. So we can use the same exact justification uh, for um, statement five as we did statement two. The same exact thing is happening. A couple of angles are being categorized as congruent because they're in corresponding positions when two uh, aforementioned lines that are parallel are being cut by a transversal. So we're good on that. Um, now this is a completely written uh, proof, like a, a chart proof, so you know that since you're just filling in the blanks, you know that the sixth statement has to be the last one, okay? So we can go ahead and just kind of let it be a little bit of a freebie and say, oh, it's got to be the proof statement. Like there's no thought that really needs to get um, involved in determining what the sixth statement is in this particular already written proof that we're just completing. What we need to do is to come up with a way to justify it. Now, you can't just write the word prove here like you do for the givens. It doesn't work that way. You actually have to justify that last um, prove statement. And so how will we justify it? Well, you might notice that there is a kind of a pathway of congruency happening here among uh, statements two, three, and five. So if you string them all together using the transitive property technically twice, uh, you will justify um, linking together angles one and four in congruency. And that's that for now. Um, once we get a little bit later into the semester, we can revisit this proof and uh, discuss how uh, we might be able to rewrite it even more concisely once new, new information comes to light. Okay, cool. So that was 4.1 and now we are taking a sharp right turn <laughs> into the uh, section on indirect proof. So for this particular style of proof writing, uh, you really need to have a certain type of um, uh, given and proved statement would be ideal. And also um, you need to rely on what we have learned about conditional statements way back in chapter two. So definitely this chapter two stuff, I know you guys were asking earlier, um, is this still going to be relevant later on in the semester when we get into like, you know, further on chapters and we're getting more and more into the geometry stuff and the proof writing and I'm just like, yes, 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 we have to like know what conditional statements are and the relationships with their related statements and so on and so forth. And so this indirect proof method definitely is a good um, continuation of that discussion. So recall that for any conditional statement, the converse is equivalent to the inverse, and by equivalent I mean logically equivalent. The conditional statement is equivalent to the contrapositive. If you remember your hand gestures, I know I don't have my webcam on as part of this video, but uh, you know, two thumbs up uh, was the 
uh, original conditional, if you switch their positions, like the left hand becomes the right and vice versa, then you're talking about the converse. If you keep them in their original positions, but put th both thumbs down, that's the inverse. And if you flip them and reverse them, so switch the positions of your hands, uh, left to right, left, right to left, and then also do thumbs down, that's the contrapositive. Uh, we can talk about that more in class if you like. Um, but anyway, uh, those are the uh, uh, components, or, or excuse me, those um, conditional and related statements that are uh, logically equivalent to one another, if you recall. So, I mean, there's this that you could put to it as well if you want to think about it symbolically, right? And this triple uh, bar symbol is just um, uh, mathematical shorthand for is equivalent to, whereas two bars would be is equal to, right? So equivalent to is a little bit of a more of a qualitative relationship uh, alluding to equality between two non-quantitative things. Okay, great. Okay, so now that we've kind of reviewed that a little bit, let's um, go ahead and review a little bit further, but in the form of an example in which we're given some conditional statement. We want to practice writing uh, the converse, inverse, and contrapositive, and then classify each statement as either true or false. So the original statement being if x is greater than 2, then x does not equal 0. Okay, so what do we think? Is that true or false? That's going to be true, right? Because um, you have this initial condition that you have to be something strictly greater than 2. So that's 3, 4, 5, 6 if you're just thinking integers or, you know, all of the fractions in between and all such that. So certainly 0 cannot be take on a value of x if we have this first stipulation in, tr in, in play. So, okay, true. Now, converse would be, you know, just switch the positions of the things. If x equals, or does not equal 0, then x is greater than 2. Okay, so is that true or false? Well, this would be false because you can come up with a counterexample, right? Like if x isn't 0, well, what if x is 1? It just has to be something not 0, right? So you can come up with myriad different numbers that um, satisfy this first um hypothesis, right, or antecedent, if you're going all the way back to chapter two, that do not satisfy the consequent or conclusion. So x equaling one would be one such counterexample. There are infinitely many, though, and it only takes finding one to make the entire statement false. Now, how would the inverse be written? This is where it can get a little tricky because, I mean, Tra negating not equal to is easy enough. It just goes back to equal to. It's like the negation just gets canceled out. But what does it mean to be not greater than two? Well, you have to think about all of the other uh, possibilities as far as what x value could be, like what um, values x could take on. If you're greater than two, you know, strictly greater than, then that means something. What would the opposite of that be? So that would be less than or equal to two. It might be very tempting to say, oh, well, if you're, um, if x is greater than two, then the opposite of that would be s x is less than two. Yes, but then it doesn't take into account the possibility of being equal, and we need to make sure that we we uh, you know um, consider that possibility as well. And then of course the negation of x equals zero is just or x is not equal to zero. The negation of that would just be x equals zero. So is the inverse true or false? Well, if we have this initial condition that we have to be less than or equal to two, let's go ahead and let x equal to. Maybe we could entertain that case, right? Uh, then x equals 0. Well, no, I just said a second ago x equals 2, so then that would be a counterexample. It doesn't matter that you could come up with a, a, a scenario in which it would work. Like at this point, you could say, okay, x is less than or equal to 2. Cool, cool, cool. Let's let x equal 0. Oh, cool. I happen to satisfy the consequent. That means it's true. No, that doesn't mean it's true. That means that it has one instance in which it's true, but there are myriad other instances, countless counterexamples that make it false, and you only need to found one counterexample in order to make the entire statement false all day long, okay? Lastly, let's uh, talk contrapositive, the flip and reverse, and that would read as if x equals 0, then x is less than or equal to 2, and certainly that is the case. We have x fixed at a particular value of 0 that happens to satisfy the inequality and the consequence, so that is true, okay? Uh, hopefully that feels uh, nice and good for everybody as far as uh, the mathematical components are concerned and our feelings about whether these things are true or false. Okay, so as you can see, right, we ha see a, a very specific case illustration in which the 
original conditional statement and contrapositive are logically equivalent. In this case, for this particular example, they're both true. And also, the converse and the inverse, while logically equivalent to one another, are not logically equivalent to you know, the original conditional or the contrapositive. There's definitely a distinction between those two different collections of related conditional statements. Okay? Now, um, introduce here an old friend. It's a chapter in chapter four. It's called the law of negative inference, and then parenthetically they put contraposition, which I find to be a, an unnecessary lengthy um, name for it. And it's the same as a valid argument that we saw in chapter two. Like literally, do you guys remember this? You remember this uh, format right here? Did you guys memorize those uh, valid arguments, those standard forms? If so, you may be looking at this and being like, oh, it's my old friend, Modus Tollens, and that would be the case. So Modus Tollens, if you recall, is basically an illustration of initializing a conditional statement and showing that by virtue of, uh, in an orderly manner, considering first the, the, the second premise, then the conclusion in a conditional manner, you're more or less um, showing the... Uh, logical equivalence of a conditional statement and it's contrapositive okay the flip in reverse okay so let's use this structure in order to for this next example uh, find an appropriate conclusion that models this very same structure so again the first premise is if P then Q the second premise is negation of Q and the conclusion is the negation of P so we, for this example, need to first read this first premise, which is an if-then, and identify what is the P component and what's the Q component. And then we'll be able to identify the Q component, negate it as our second premise. Wait a minute, they already did that. And then we can negate the, um, uh, the uh, antecedent, or I guess it's now called the hypothesis, in order to make our conclusion. But let me go ahead and just read out loud the first premise. If two triangles are congruent, then the triangles are similar. Then specifically named triangles are, are identified. Triangle ABC and triangle DEF are not similar. So that's the, like the negation of Q here. So then the negation of P with these specifically named triangles would read as triangle ABC and triangle DEF are not congruent, right? Okay, so hopefully that is uh, pretty straightforward, uh, but please let me know if you have any questions about that in class. Alrighty, moving on to the next thing. I think we are ready to um, yeah, talk about the actual procedure of writing an indirect proof. And it's called the law of negative inference contraposition. Uh, yeah, so it is that is the name for the method. And so generally, uh, we are given some sort of hypothesis and we are set to prove the conclusion, right? P, if P then Q. So the indirect method would have us start with the negation of Q, assuming it's true. So we want to assume the prove statement is false, okay? So the negation of it would therefore be true. Does that, how, how, let me know if that's landing for you guys. So then you want to reason from there, take a couple of steps or maybe even just one step it might be a short distance uh, for you to um, reach a contradiction and how will you know that you've reached a contradiction well basically you're going to uh, conclude something that's the opposite of the original given information so that's gonna be where you stop in your tracks and you say all right contradiction reached then we state that the negation of Q, the thing that we uh, assumed to be true in the beginning, must be false, and that therefore Q must there be true, okay? Now I think this method, describing it in this general way, can be a little bit confusing and not super helpful just to read it in only this way. So definitely we have an example, and this will be the how we wrap up the lecture video today. And we could do more examples in class if this uh, one example isn't really landing you just let me know okay and one thing I want you to also notice when you're doing your homework exercises is all of the negation keywords <laughs> and symbols uh, indirect proofs are really very good uh, a, a very good method for um, proof when you are 
ha having to deal with given and proof statements that are rife with negation. Um, also, I want to uh, highlight that indirect proofs are generally written in paragraph form. Now, this is not a form that we will be spending a lot of time in outside of this section until we are like chapters much later on in the semester. I'll tell you what I mean when we get there. But for now, uh, just go ahead and follow along with me in this um, example of direct indirect proof writing, okay? So again, the method is we have given P, P in this case is, angle ABD is not congruent to angle DBC. Okay, that's P. And then Q is going to be um, ray BD does not bisect angle ABC. And so what we want to do is assume the negation of the proof statement. So what would be the negation of ray DB does not bisect angle B ABC? It would be that ray BD does in fact, bisect angle ABC. So you can just, you know, write the most concise way of uh, stating that possible. And if you're following along with me, you can go ahead and copy word for word what I'm doing just as a, a mechanism of, uh, you know, uh, practice. Assume ray BD does bisect angle ABC. Well then, if it bisects the angle, then what can you say about the measures of the angles that are formed? By definition, you would be able to state that the measure of angle ABD is equal to the measure of angle DBC, the two angles that are formed by virtue of the incorporation of this ray categorized as an angle bisector, right? Okay, cool. So if the measures are equal, then the angles are congruent. But wait, y'all, what was stated in the given statement here? The given statement said emphatically that these angles were not congruent. This is what I mean by you have to reason your way toward a contradiction. And the contradiction is going to be exactly the opposite of what the original given statement was. We have reached our contradiction, folks. It's uh, by virtue of assuming the negation of the uh, proof statement, I have reasoned the exact opposite of the uh, given statement. But that's not cool. We can't just, uh, you know... What's the word I'm looking for? Um, yeah, as, uh, go that route. <laughs> so, um, no, no, no. That, what I mean to say is that um, finding this contradiction is the next, it um, has us arrive at the next step of the process, which is just to say, it, uh, we need to um, state that we've um, met with a contradiction because the given, the original given statement was that the two angles were not congruent. And I just reasoned my way towards saying that they were. Contradiction has been reached. Therefore, it must be true that, and just put the original proof statement down. Ray BD does not bisect angle ABC. And it's literally that cut and dry with the process. Again, the steps are assume the negation of the proof statement. Take steps to reason your way forward to reaching a contradiction, which will be the negation of the given statement. Say contradiction reached and then and then state as your conclusion that the original proof statement must therefore be true. And that's all that's all there is to it. All right, so have fun practicing. Uh, let me know if there are uh, problems that uh, you come across that are weird and you'd like me to demonstrate in class, I'd be happy to do any of them. Uh, in class uh, via Zoom, whiteboard, or uh, some such mechanism that seems appropriate. Cool. Uh, now uh, go ahead and watch a construction six um, demonstration video, which should be right after this one in the uh, Canvas list of materials. All right, see you soon.